Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be welcoming not one but two guests today from IBM. We've got Eric Manza and Yves Vuillet. And so we're, we're doing this from multiple uh, countries today. So we're in Ireland, USA, UK, and also Belgium. So uh, it's a truly international Access Chat today. So welcome Eve, welcome Eric. Uh, it's really good to have you with us. Um, Eric, I know you've by reputation, Eve, we've met uh, at, at various events before now. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. And um, IBM has a long history in the field of, of accessibility. We've, we've focused on it on a couple of previous access chats, but it's great to, to have this from, from some different perspectives in, in the organization. So you're going to talk about a number of different things today. So, um, which of you wants to go first? Can you, uh, Eve? I'll pick on you. So, how how how, <laughs> how did you get um, how did you get into working into accessibility in in IBM? Actually, uh, thanks for for inviting me first. Um, actually, um, you know, I'm I've been a wheelchair user for many years now uh, because of a motorcycle accident secured in 1987. I was 21 at that time, so don't waste your time calculating. I'm 52. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, uh, you know, so I joined IBM in 1992. So I was already using a wheelchair at that time, but not many companies were inclusive, uh, or at least were not really inclusive. And so I, I, I cannot tell you how many uh, resumes I sent. Uh, before getting invited to to, in, to an interview uh, to get a job, and so basically uh, IBM was one of the first companies willing to 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 hire me that thought that I had the skills uh, that are were you know that were appropriate for to do the job that I was supposed to do at that time. I joined IBM as an administrative assistant, which is the uh, politically correct word for secretary. Um, at that time, we still needed some uh, staff to assist people. Now, with the digitalization, uh, things have changed. But at that time, back in the 90s, it was still relevant to to have uh, people like myself. And so, basically, my as you can imagine, my resume at 21 was as thin as a razor blade. But still, they <laughs> believed that I had the appropriate skills to do the job. And then I took some, uh, you know, I started working in sales as administrative assistant. I took up some role, some education, both internally and externally, because in addition to being inclusive, IBM also has a vast education and training uh, material available, catalog available, and strongly encourage their employees to uh, to keep, you know, to keep their skills uh, up to date and to develop new talent. And this is also one of the reasons why this uh, company is 100 years old. It's because it's been focusing not only on hiring diverse uh, employees, but also making sure that our skills uh, keep being relevant, relevant to uh, to the you know to the contemporary sorry market uh, demands. And I joined the HR team four years ago. My my role now is to as uh, is to drive IBM's global disability and inclusion uh, strategy in the uh, in, in the uh, all the can all the uh, countries where we are. Fantastic, and, and and it is a it is a long history. I I I've obviously followed it and studied it uh, to a certain extent uh, because IBM's been around for longer than any of the rest of us, uh, and, and so you've been a, a, a model for, for for what we're doing. And of course, we all, you know, aspire to be inclusive and and educate our, our workforce. So this is this is, I think, something that is it's always been important, but it's increasingly so. Um, and 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 Eric, again, you you. you You've got a long history in IBM as well, I understand it, but uh, a different one, obviously. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, you know, actually, I got to IBM. I joined the team here about uh, four and a half, going on five years ago now. And, you know, I was uh, able to join as part of IBM's accessibility team. Uh, and, you know, 
that stemmed from my own experience uh, with disability as uh, someone who has been losing vision. Um, you know, I have a degenerative eye disease and, we, you know, we learned when I was five years old that I had this condition that leads to blindness. Uh, and so, you know, as a younger person, I had way more vision than I do today. Uh, but, you know, it was kind of a gradual progression where I would notice changes uh, in my ability to see. And so just over time, you know, as someone who was struggling myself a little bit to use technology, um, you know, I was working at a different technology company and I noticed that, you know, it was becoming more and more difficult. And so it was really that firsthand experience that I was having uh, that led me to an interest and a study of accessibility and the importance of it. Uh, and so, you know, over about a decade or so, you know, I was really studying up on accessibility, kind of the standards, the guidelines, uh, what laws are in place, that kind of thing. And so just became more and more, you know, informed. Uh, and I was even doing, you know, volunteer uh, user testing uh, from the perspective of someone with low vision and, you know, offering feedback uh, on, you know, what worked well, what didn't work so well. And just over time, you know, I eventually made my way to, you know, meeting at the time it was Francis West uh, here at IBM uh, and kind of shared my experience with her. and you know, was blown away to learn that they had full-time positions where, you know, you, you could focus entirely on accessibility. And so, you know, I came from kind of an inside sales customer support role at a different company and from kind of a lived experience angle was able to transition that into uh, a career where, where I was able to focus on accessibility as a profession. And so, you know, my time at IBM has been humbling and very thrilling to just join this incredible world-class team with, you know, groups of talent all over the globe, <laughs> uh, you know, focusing on accessibility and, and kind of helping drive that conversation forward. So it, it's been a thrill to be here in, in kind of these uh, very fast four and a half years. Deborah, you're on mute. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, it, it's been really exciting to watch the progress. Uh, I know that, um, it, uh, you know, Eric, I've been tracking your work for a long time. I love the work that Eves does. Um, and uh, one thing that I think is interesting about IBM is that, uh, as you're both saying, you're making a lot of global efforts, but it, it appears to me that IBM has done a good job of taking inclusion and accessibility and really blending it internally. Um, and, you know, I know, Eves, that you are, I, I believe, the chair, chair of the board of the ILO's Global Business Disability Network, and we've actually had you on before talking about that. So I know there's a lot of global efforts that you've made but it's hard to really deal with these issues from a global perspective. And so I, I would be interested in y'all talking a little bit about the history, because one thing that fascinates me about IBM, because a lot of us talking about accessibility and disability inclusion, and I'm coming from the US, so we started talking about it, really talking about it when our Section 508 was uh, updated in 2001. But IBM's history is going back to 1914. So I would be curious about y'all talking a little bit about the history and also having Eves, because I know that Neil also is a leader at the Global Business Disability Network with ILO. So I would love to see Eves sort of, you know, roll in why the global, showing global, le global leadership in this is so important to IBM. So I'm sort of throwing two questions at you and then I will now go back on mute. Uh, if it's all right, I'll jump in, Eve, on the on the first one uh, and talk a little bit about the history. Just because, you know, as an IBM employee, like in, in my time here, that's been something of particular pride for me. Like, you know, I I also try and be, uh, you know, sort of an outspoken advocate in the community uh, with regards to disability related issues, and um, you know, oftentimes in conversation. Uh, you know, I will hear from folks, you know, questioning, you know, what is IBM doing in this space? And, and you know, wh why should I care about, you know, IBM's involvement in accessibility? And, I, you know, I'm always very proud of the fact, I, I think it's a very, dis you know, distinct, um, you know, feature or characteristic of, of IBM in that we are a tech company that's over 100 years old. And, 
you know, consistently throughout that timeline, what we see is just an emphasis being placed on, you know, the importance of uh, diversity in the workplace and, and inclusive practices. And so, you know, even in times more recently now where, you know, there is, you know, kind of the hot topic is diversity and inclusion. I mean, I, I think we all know and recognize that, you know, it's possible for disability, even in those discussions to be overlooked. Uh, but when we look back on the IBM timeline, going back over a hundred years, like, you know, disability was cons consistently uh, factored in and included. Like, you know, like you mentioned, Deborah, we hired the first employee with a disability in 1914. Uh, but, you know, even moving forward from there, I mean, IBM had involvement with, uh, you know, the first Braille printer in the 1970s and, um, you know, the, uh, the talking typewriter in the 1980s. And so, I mean, IBM innovation and talent uh, ha has had kind of a consistent link throughout the, over the, the time. And so, you know, one thing that I was especially excited about this uh, last week was at CES uh, in Las Vegas. Um, our colleague here at IBM, Dr. Chieko Asakawa, um, and uh, some of her earlier work uh, having to do with the homepage reader and, you know, just a, a great focus. I mean, she, she is someone who happens to be blind herself uh, and has been an accessibility pioneer. Uh, and she was just, uh, you know, inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, uh, which was a great, you know, an exciting honor for her and, and wonderful to see. And it was announced at this, you know, at CES uh, on stage. And so, you know, again, uh, I take great pride in, you know, the consistency throughout. And again, I think we all recognize that, you know, in order for the accessibility message to really take hold within any organization, it has to start with inclusive practices. I mean, you can't expect teams uh, to consider all users unless all users are actively, you know, front and center and involved and active in the day to day. So, you know, again, seeing that consistently in IBM's history is a great source of pride for me, and I know I've gone on here, so I'll pass it over to Eve for the uh, the second part of the question. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, actually, to complement your your comments uh, around the the innovation and techniques, uh, um, I would like to, and technology. I would like to also insist on the fact that uh, it, back in 1995, IBM uh, created a task force composed of executives from different organizations, uh, IBM organizations like legal, HR, technology, accessibility, etc., to kind of uh, structure the efforts of the IBM, the, that the IBM company was doing in terms of uh, facilitating the inclusion of people with different abilities in IBM, because we, we needed to really uh, put a structure uh, behind our efforts to support not only, of course, this effort started in the U.S. and the ADA, by the way, was really a, a very strong uh, motivation for for the company to, uh, you know, to really kind of structure our uh, our policies, our disability inclusion policies. And then uh, when we started to expand globally this effort, we were confronted on uh, on. A, a, you know, to a set of different uh, issues in terms of uh, cultural, different cultural perceptions of disability, uh, the level of accessibility of a given country uh, may be extremely different from another's. So uh, we need to, and the access to education, access to buildings, access to infrastructure, um, that all these different factors uh, made us realize that we needed to adopt to, to, to adjust, to be flexible in our approach, uh, to make sure that the standard offering in terms of disability inclusion that we were uh, proposing to the countries would reflect the local constraints and would address the local constraints that we face in terms of, as I said, accessibility and uh, culture. And I think, of course, it remains a challenge, honestly. Uh, the idea is not to give an ideal, idealistic picture of what we do, but still, uh, thanks to the support of our uh, colleagues locally, all everything you do, everything I do, uh, is really supported at country level. And I think you will agree with me when we hear people from India, from China, uh, our colleagues there willing to help us 
uh, to test new tools to you know to collaborate with us on making IBM more inclusive, uh, even more inclusive than it is today. Uh, it really illustrates the fact that you know this this sense of belonging to a, a single organization, being IBMers regardless of where we are, regardless of the issues we face in terms of um, accessibility constraints, cultural constraints, internal roadblocks. Let's talk about it as well. Uh, everything, you know, we are an, a, we are really a family. We have a strong sense of community. And one 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 clear example of that is Eric and myself. We are not on the same side of the ocean. Uh, we don't have, of course, the same kind of, of, of we don't live with the same type of disability, but we work together. We drive IBM's disability agenda together on different perspectives. Uh, Eric is more on the technical side. I am more on the HR side of the house, but we complement each other. So, and uh, if, so uh, going back to when you started working on accessibility, uh, do you feel that today you don't have to explain yourself as much that you have to do in the past in order to highlight the importance of, of accessibility and how important this is not only for you as, as IBM as an organization, but also the impact that this can have in your own customers. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. We, we, we you know, th that's why also IBM needs to work with external uh, NGOs in order to be visible. Because as you said, uh, even if we if we have a long tradition or a very long heritage in terms of disability inclusion, it's a never-ending effort to to improve. To, as I said, we need to rely on local partners, external partners, to really help us uh, identify people with disabilities having the skills or at least potential to develop skills that are business needs to, to thrive. And this is why IBM, you know, is a member of different organizations, including the ILO International Labor Organization Global Business and Disability Network, because we can leverage the global presence of the ILO worldwide so that you know we can always rely on their expertise to help us identify the local partners that will help us uh, you know if being really inclusive visible in our disability strategy locally in countries where we know that the challenges are strong and we need partners to help us overcome them. And just to add to that, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Eric here. Um, you know, just to add to what Eve was saying, I mean, absolutely, uh, accessibility remains a work in progress. And I think that's true, you know, with any organization. Um, you know, there is no kind of perfect uh, perfection in accessibility. It's, it's an ongoing effort. And, you know, I think by its very nature, we'll, we'll remain that way. And so to answer, you know, or to, you know, touch on Antonio's question, like, you know, to look back over how the conversations have changed. Like as we reach out across product teams at IBM, you know, 10 years ago, we were having a very different conversation than we are today. And, and so that discussion has really evolved. Um, you know, by and large, you know, clearly there's a difference in the appreciation and recognition uh, across product teams as to the importance of accessibility. Like we don't have to make the case for it anymore. Everyone, everyone's on board, like they get it. Um, and it's really evolved to the point where I think more and more uh, the, the value and the importance to the bottom line as a business driver uh, is being recognized. And not only that, but, you know, with case by case of examples out there that, you know, the fact that uh, assistive technology and accessible technology actually is a, a driver of innovation, like new innovation comes from uh, things rooted in accessible technology all the time. So, you know, I think that you know, the transformation of the discussion has also led to new realizations that, you know, innovation happens as a result of, of these conversations. So it's uh, it's been an exciting thing to watch. Absolutely, I'm, I'm forever um, proselytizing about the benefits of innovation spurred by people understanding the challenges that people with disabilities have doing day-to-day -day things and the uh, the in innovations and inventions that have come about that we take for granted now in our day-to-day -day lives that have actually been born out of people solving the challenges uh, of, of disability. I think I wanted to hark back to something that, that uh, Eve was talking about, and that's the sort of 
the benefits of, of participation in, in these sort of large international events. And I think that accessibility is one of those areas where uh, organizations that sometimes naturally compete with each other can actually collaborate. And it's, it's, it's one of the things I really like about the, the accessibility industry is yes, yes we're, we're also, and I work for an IT company, yes, sometimes we buy your service, sometimes we compete against you, it's that kind of world. But when it comes to uh, disability inclusion, we all profit from working together to share knowledge, share experience, how we can be more inclusive. Uh, because it's a benefit to us all to do so. So I think one of the things I really like about uh, the ILO and Business Disability Forum is that they are places where people talk about not just the sort of the sort of here's our glossy marketing brochure about how shiny we are and and how good we are, but also you know these are the these are the things that we we found difficult. These are the things, and this is what we did to overcome it. And this is how we um, how we dealt with these challenges that were presented to us by you know the culture or the country or the the, the legislation. And and that's really valuable because if that stuff stays in silos, you know society doesn't benefit. So I, I think it's really great that that organisations like Atos, like IBM, like um, you know, a, a Deco Group and and others are, are and and L'Oreal and all of these organisations are signed up and, and and ready to absolutely make sure that uh, that they're sharing their practice, that they're sharing what they know, they're sharing the the pitfalls and and also the the benefits that they found from from engaging in this. Uh, I mean, Eve, what what's your experience from? What are the, what are some of the key benefits that you've taken from your participation? Oh, absolutely, Neil. You're 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 absolutely right. Uh, you know, working in silo is no longer an option. It's it's should, you know, basically as you said, uh, we are not an island, and we need to benefit from each other's experience. Um, to illustrate this, recently, uh, I think you you were there as well in Geneva during the ILO Global Business and Disability Annual Conference, we heard a lot of different perspectives uh, coming from, you know, basically, you and I are a member of a global organizations that do have a very uh, similar operation operational models. And when we hear about the, the constraints that they face in Bangladesh, for instance, or in, in, in countries where the level of accessibility is so low, that they are still struggling today with the basics. It really helps us to be more humble and to really think about all the things that we still need to do to um, to advance the disability agenda uh, in these countries. And we have a key role to play, not only as ambassador, but also uh, to, to make sure that we, we we understand and integrate the, 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 the key concepts that are being shared uh, by these people who are facing extremely difficult issues on a daily basis, whether it's going to work simply by, there is no bus accessible, so what do I do to get to, to work, you know? Here we are talking about accessible technologies, we are talking about assistive technologies. Some people are still even struggling to get on a bus to go to work. And so this is a reality that we have to keep in mind. And, and I believe, as you said, uh, leveraging platforms share, for sharing uh, this kind of perspectives is really helping a lot of people working at global level. So, so let me ask, so you, you, Neil and Deborah, you have in the ILO uh, um, calls and events, um, ILO has a, you know, is working not only in this area of accessibility, but also in other aspects of work. Um, what do you think, uh, it, how could, do you think you, you can help ILO to really scale accessibility and to bring more countries into this conversation? Because I've, I've assisted to some calls and sometimes I realize that, you know, we look at, let's say Europe, there are still a lot of countries who are missing out from those conversations on accessibility at the ILO meetings. 
Well, I'll jump in um, partially on that. Uh, I, and I think that's a really good point that you're making, Antonio. Um, and, and, and excuse me if I don't have the number correct, but I think I'm pretty close. But the ILO has 27, I believe, national networks. So one thing that I like about what the ILO is doing is they they don't want to get in the way of local and national conversations. They, they understand, though, that the multinationals, like an ATOS or an IBM, you got to think about it in a much broader way. And so they encourage the national networks, and I'm almost sure they have 27 of them, Mexico, Bangladesh, you know, other countries. But of course, um, and the number sort of shifts depending on how many countries we have in the world, but it's around 215-ish um, because some countries are still dividing, changing names, things like that. And so it, it's there's still a lot of work to do, but it, it's interesting watching, um, you know, the, the countries that are involved. And, of course, some of the countries that are involved, of course, as Eves was saying, um, and, and even um, Neil talked about it as well, they're, they're working on things that, you know, like, how do I even get to work? I remember when I visited Kenya a few years ago, I saw a woman in a wheelchair that had to wait for the kindness of two very strong strangers to pick her in her wheelchair up and bring her over um, the mud and stuff so that she could get in the bank. And so I thought, okay. So she was able to get in the bank. And then I thought, so then she does her banking and she has to go out and wait once again for the kindness of strangers to pick her wheelchair up. And you, anyway, so there's still so much work to do, which is why I think these conversations are really important. But the ILO, as you're saying, Antonio, is also, you know, they're looking at labor across employment across the world, not just accessibility and inclusion. So they're really into the future of work and what's going to happen with technology. And I know that Stefan, the, you know, the, the executive director of the ILO GBDN, um, he tries so hard to make sure if the ILO is having youth and dis, uh, youth in work and new employment and everything conversations, are we, are we including the disability conversations? Are we including the accessibility conversations? How can we have a conversation about a future of work if we're not including this in there. So I, I know that they're conscious of it and trying to work on it. And I'm going to, Eric, I don't know if you want to make a comment here. You you looked like you wanted to make well, a comment. Well, yeah, no, I was obviously in full agreement. And, you know, again, have, wearing my advocacy hat, I mean, <laughs> I'm, you know, very much of, of the in agreement or of the mindset that, you know, it's a human right, you know, and accessibility is, you know, when you boil it down. And so, therefore, in my mind, it should transcend kind of traditional matters of business competition and it should have this kind of global feel to it. So absolutely in agreement. And Eves or, uh, Eves or Neil, you want to go? Neil, you go? I, I, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think that even though uh, we have participants from a number of different European nations as part of the, the ILO, most of the conversations are happening in English, so you may not even recognize that, that, that the, the organizations represented are French or German or whatever, because guess what, you know, the, the, the language of, of business and, um, yeah, let's face it, us, us Anglophones are quite lazy. So, um, you know, quite, quite often, you know, you've got people from L'Oreal or from, you know, uh, various large organizations that are predominantly European, predominantly Central European and, and not UK, USA based, still speaking in English. And Eve, you're based in Belgium, you're speaking in English today. We're not, we're not holding this conversation in Flemish. That said, I think it's really important that we do learn from what's going on in other parts of the world and what's going on in accessibility in other languages. And, and we know for example, that, that there's an awful lot going on in South America and in Spain and so on. Spanish language accessibility is a really rich area and a really rich topic. And yeah, absolutely. We also, Deborah's just put in the chat window about the, the progress that's being made in the Middle East. And that's an area that yeah, they've, they've recognized they have need. Uh, and they're, they're busy developing technology to, to meet their language, their culture. So I think it, I think it is really interesting. But we, yeah, you're right. We kind of need to have a focus on that. But sometimes, our, uh, you know, those voices get lost. 
Sir. Well, it, it's interesting. Well, I would make an interesting analogy, uh, Neil, based on what you just said regarding communication in different language. Uh, you know, we can define if we think about disability in a broader sense. Uh, the inability to communicate may be regarded as a, some sort of a disability. Sure. Uh, and talking about different languages, sometimes when you know French is my mother tongue, and so I can speak English with a French accent. Are you sure you understand what I'm talking about? This kind of thing, you know, people. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it may be, you know, to have a, a, a normal conversation with people having, uh, because as you said, Neil, English being the, 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 the main vehicle, language vehicle for uh, sharing current input and, and perspectives around disability. Sometimes uh, the inability to communicate is a, a major issue. And I think that, you know, the more you, you, or confronted or you you speak with people from different culture it enriches your own uh, ability to be more inclusive uh, this beyond disability yeah that, that, that's a great comment and I, and I think that uh, yeah we, we lazy anglophones do need to <laughs> look at this more um, uh, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm used to hearing English in a French accent. You know, Atos is a is a, a, a largely French company. We're headquartered in Bezon outside Paris, so <laughs> so it's okay. Whichever way you 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 phrase your English, I'm I'm all right with it. But then no, it's, it's it's a very valid point. I think actually that lack of ability to be understood to communicate in the language in which most of this is reported is stopping people from realizing the innovation that's out there uh, it's one of the reasons why on access chat we try and take an international focus when we can you know it would be great to get uh, Nabil uh, back from from Syria it'd be great to talk to the guys back in Egypt again because actually you know there, there is work going on Indeed. Um, Deborah, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I was just, uh, you know, one thing I, I, and I don't want to move away from this, but one thing I'm curious about is, uh, you know, I think IBM has done a good job of, you know, uh, a history of accessibility and disability inclusion. I think a lot is happening that, you know, since you're business to business, maybe it's not communicated as much to the consumers, which makes sense. But I, I wonder what's next for IBM. I mean, I know that we're all very interested in what's happening with artificial intelligence and robotics and a lot of things you're doing there. And I know you're involved, you know, in the future of work conversations, but I'm just curious from your perspective, what's next and how do we continue to blend it into making sure that people with disabilities are fully included in a lot of ways? Yeah, I can jump in on that. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, in, in the most, you know, in, in recent years, you know, admittedly, we've had kind of more of an enterprise focus and, um, you know, doing a lot with, with business to business relationships and, you know, again, still wearing my advocate hat, uh, you know, my argument would be that, you know, businesses are all made up of people. And so accessibility is still very, very relevant. And so, you know, without um, deviating from that point, you know, we've, you know, the, the accessibility team at IBM <clears throat> has been, you know, very, uh, I guess, determined in, still evangelizing the importance of accessibility you know we're not you know because we have a business focus doesn't mean that you know we should be doing anything any less with when it comes to accessibility and, and driving that message and so um you know what i would expect uh is that you know moving forward like as we're like we just made a, a major announcement at ces with our quantum computing as an example and you know, I can say confidently that the, you know, the product teams behind, you know, these emerging technologies uh, are all, you know, well aware, well versed in accessibility and the standards and practices. And, and so, you know, I take uh, a lot of comfort in that fact. Uh, and also, uh, 
you know, remain kind of committed to our customers and want to hear, you know, even with the business relationships, you know, we're open to feedback and certainly open to hearing if, you know, customers have specific accessibility needs or they're hearing from their users uh, that they face barriers or challenges. Like, you know, we are very open and again to the, you know, in the interest of this is a work in progress for all of us. Um, you know, we feel like we do a good job with it, but, you know, we're also very open to feedback and inviting of feedback. So, you know, if any of the business customers that, that you know, IBM does business with and, and vice versa, like if, if there are accessibility concerns or uh, considerations that may have been, um, you know, missed or, or not addressed, then we are certainly open and, and receptive to feedback and, and, you know, love to get it. So. Yeah, I will uh, also compliment. I'm sorry, go Neil, go ahead, please. Go ahead. No, no, go for, go for it. Well, I just wanted to uh, compliment um, Eric's comments around AI. Uh, we all know that AI might have biases, right? And so sure. the, 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 the burning issue from a disability perspective is how do we make sure that the AI tools do avoid uh, bias? Because at the end of the day, people behind AI are human beings, right? And so they have their own bias. And so we, we, we recently uh, saw some articles in the press regarding this, not really directly related to disability, but to uh, other types of, of, of diversity constituencies. And I think that we, we as, as Eric uh, knows very well, uh, he, he even knows this better than I, uh, we, we are in IBM, we are extremely, extremely uh, careful making sure that our AI is bias free, or at least that we work on that to make sure that we become uh, as bias free as possible. We, we are doing a lot of work around that. And I believe personally, and this is my personal opinion, that we should be extremely careful and keep working intensively on, on this topic to avoid that, uh, you know, basically AI must remain um, must help us uh, becoming more inclusive and not the other way around. So, what are the areas of technology that you know, you know, that you see uh, that excites you more, and you, you see more prospects of uh, becoming a reality in, in the accessibility area and being able to be uh, very helpful in order to, to improve the quality of life of individuals or and make them more. Uh, uh, also accessible and allow them to have a more wider participation in the in in the, in, the, in today's world. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that. As you know, again, as someone with a disability, I have had the great pleasure recently, and you know, over the last you know twelve to twelve to eighteen months of uh, working on projects that involved, like like he was saying, artificial intelligence, kind of you know making sure that you know, our, our models for training AI are including, uh, you know, people with disabilities so that, you know, when AI, um, you know, chatbots or, or what have you encounter uh, or have an interaction with someone who has a disability that, you know, they are seamless interactions. And, you know, it's not that, you know, the disability should be uh, seen as anything other than human. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that AI fairness includes uh, the perspectives of, of people with disabilities was one project I was, uh, you know, very happy to contribute to. And then, you know, also self-driving cars, you know, as someone who has kind of had a gradual path to disability over time, you know, there was a time where I could drive a car. And, you know, there there's a great sort of sense of loss when you have to give up that feeling of independence and in some ways dignity, like when you have to give up your, your mobility and stop driving. And I, you know, I had to go through that, you know, about 18 years ago now. And, and so the prospect that self-driving technology could, you know, return some of that independence uh, is very, very exciting. And so I was able to, you know, and excited to contribute to, um, you know, a, a project that involved autonomous vehicles and, you know, not necessarily on the self-driving piece of the technology, but really on the accessibility of the technology. I mean, if I, 
you know, have a self-driving vehicle in my driveway as someone with a disability, it's no good to me if I go jump in it and I can't operate it. You know, the interface is not something that I can, can independently, uh, you know, control. So, you know, having the ability to work on these types of projects and offer perspective and make sure that, you know, the disability viewpoint is being represented is, is extremely rewarding. Uh, and, you know, so those are the types of technologies that I'm most excited about these days. Excellent. And, and, and you mentioned CES and quantum and, and you know, um, there aren't many companies that are engaged in quantum, IBM and Atos being, you know, two fairly uh, unique, uh, well, you can't be two and unique. Uh, yeah. The grammar police will get me on that one. But, uh, <laughs> but essentially, you know, there aren't many organizations working in quantum. What are the sort of, quantum enables you to, to solve certain types of, of issues um, through the way that it uniquely computes stuff, you know, with stuff being in, in different states at the same time. So what do you think are the, the problems that you think you could apply quantum to that, that, that the disability world is not able to solve right now? That is a great question, Neil. And to be honest with you, I've, you know, been so swept up in the announcement or the release of the, uh, you know, the system Q, <laughs> the, the Q, you know, system one at uh, CES that, you know, I haven't really sat back and thought about the, you know, the kind of accessibility specific items that can be addressed. I know that, you know, it, it represents, you know, a great level of excitement for scientists and for, you know, for a lot of business applications. But, um, you know, that that is something I'll need to ponder and, and see how we kind of wrap uh, that piece of our portfolio into the accessibility endeavors that we have. <laughs> I think it, yeah. it has I agree. great problems. That's a yeah. great question. That's a great yeah. question. I was like, oh, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> what a good question. Eves, you got uh, that I'm, answer? I'm... <laughs> well, my answer uh, is I'm very lucky that Eric is with us here. Otherwise, <laughs> I, would, I would look completely stupid, not able to answer the question. Eric, you <laughs> saved my life, basically. Thank, thank <laughs> goodness for Eric. Thank goodness for Eric. Well, that's that's the my, cred my yeah. credibility remains unheard. Uh, <laughs> it's a great question, Neil. Okay, uh, I mean, I, I think you know the the you know it's it's a different way. You know, it's not like you, a quantum computer is not going to be a desktop computer. You know, right. in in some ways, traditional computers are still going to do your day to day computing tasks faster than the quantum machine can. But right. what they can do is really complex calculations. So maybe it's you know giving us ways of determining you know. Uh, color and light, and, and maybe it's all of those kind of real subtle things that we're looking to. Uh, we had the discussion about artificial intelligence the other week with jo uh, Dr. Joanna Bryson, um, and she was saying, well, you know, at the moment, artificial intelligence can't give you the subtlety of an, an comparative experience. You know, you can go out and you can be shown. Uh, you can you can point your camera phone at something, and it will tell you. That is blue. That is red. Sure. But it, it won't it won't give you that same equivalence of experiences as, as from your from your senses. So maybe it's it's about using the the, the deep computational power to to give us that subtlety. I, I don't know yet either. I think it's it's early days, but it's 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 kind of quite an exciting prospect to to look at some of this stuff. And For sure. uh, and, and and certainly uh, that interests me more than um, encryption, which is one of the other areas where you know people are looking to apply uh, quantum to. So I think we're pretty much at the end of our time. It's been great chatting with you. It's passed way too quickly. Need to thank uh, you know our, our, our friends and supporters that keep us going here at Access Chat. So Barclays and MyClearText for all of the captioning and uh, we'll be making some announcements about some new supporters soon. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, we look forward to joining you on Twitter. Thank you again. Our pleasure. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.